All right, here's a sim on journal entries and ratios. Perfect for audit, and something very similar could appear on the FAR exam. Journal entries and ratios you could see on audit, you could see it for FAR. So part one, Sadecki and Gibson CPAs are performing an audit of Major Corp, a non-issuer. For each numbered item, prepare the adjusting or correcting journal entry and then determine the impact on the inventory turnover ratio after the correction or adjustment. If no entry is needed, write no entry needed. If there's no impact on the inventory turnover ratio, write no impact. And of course the inventory turnover ratio is cost of goods sold divided by average inventory. Anytime you're comparing an income statement account in the numerator with a balance sheet account in the denominator, the balance sheet account will be an average rather than an ending or beginning amount. So notice how you have average inventory there, not ending inventory or even beginning inventory, but average inventory. And that's because the income statement covers an entire year. Cost of goods sold is a figure for the entire year, but the balance sheet covers only one moment in time. So if we were to use ending inventory or beginning inventory, we'd be biased with regard to this ratio. So by using average inventory, we stay away from bias. So let's look at number one. Major Corp fails to record inventory in transit at year end with shipping terms, FOB shipping point, since the vendor invoice had not arrived by year end. So they're giving you a hint that Major Corp is the buyer of this inventory by saying that the vendor invoice had not arrived by year end and that Major Corp did not record that inventory in transit at year end and that the shipping terms FOB shipping point clearly indicate that they should have included this inventory at year end. So what should the journal entry be at year end to correct this mistake? And the journal entry would be a debit to inventory and a credit to accounts payable. Since the inventory should have been recorded at year end and it wasn't, we need to make that correcting entry. So now the increase in the inventory would increase the denominator of the inventory turnover ratio. So average inventory goes up, denominator up, and that means ratio down. So the increase in average inventory will decrease the inventory turnover ratio. So the impact on inventory turnover ratio, you tell the exam, would be a decrease. And just make a note, as the denominator goes up in a ratio, the ratio goes the opposite direction. So if the denominator goes up, the ratio goes down. Now, if there's no impact on the numerator of this ratio because accounts payable is a liability, that does not impact the inventory turnover ratio. There's no impact on cost of goods sold here, the numerator of the ratio. There's only an impact on the denominator. All right, let's go to number two. Inventory in one of Major Corp's new warehouses on December 31st was inadvertently omitted by Major Corp during the year-end physical count. So here they had inventory in a warehouse. They forgot to count it because it was a new warehouse. They forgot they had the new warehouse. They never counted that inventory in the year-end physical count. Is there a journal entry needed? And what's the impact on inventory turnover? Well, the answer is the journal entry would include a debit to inventory and a credit to cost of goods sold. The increase in inventory would increase the denominator and denominator up, ratio down. but the decrease in cost of goods sold would decrease the numerator and as the numerator of a ratio goes so goes the ratio so numerator down ratio down as cost of goods sold goes down the numerator falls so does the ratio as average inventory goes up then the denominator goes up and the ratio goes down so this is the perfect storm for the ratio to fall because the numerator is going down and the denominator is going up and both of those will decrease the ratio. Number three, during the physical inventory, Major Corp included inventory out on consignment. Well, Major Corp owns the inventory that's out on consignment, right? Because when you have inventory out on consignment, 
you, the consignor of that inventory, are the rightful owner. So they didn't do anything wrong there by including inventory out on consignment, then all is well and no entries needed. Inventory out on consignment should always be included in the inventory count, and it was, so no problem there. No impact on inventory turnover ratio, no journal entry needed. Let's look at four. During the physical inventory count, Major Corp included inventory that it was holding on consignment. Okay, now that's a problem because when you're holding inventory on consignment, it belongs to someone else. You're the consignee, you're holding inventory on consignment. But that inventory belongs to the consignor, so Major Corp should not have counted it in their inventory. So what's the journal entry? The entry would be a debit to cost of goods sold and a credit to inventory. Since the inventory being held on consignment was counted, then ending inventory was too high. Ending inventory overstated, cost of goods sold understated. So by reducing average inventory, that's going to decrease the denominator. And denominator down, ratio up. So this is going to increase the inventory turnover ratio. And the debit to cost of goods sold would increase the numerator. And as the numerator goes up, the ratio goes up. So this happens to be the perfect storm for the ratio to increase because the numerator goes up and the denominator goes down, either of which would increase the ratio. So when both of them would be impacted like that, then you know that the ratio will be increasing. Remember, what's the ratio for inventory turnover? Cost of goods sold divided by average inventory. So if cost of goods sold is going up, then numerator up. Numerator up, ratio up. And in number four here, you can see that inventory gets credited. So inventory down, denominator down. Denominator down, ratio up. And now for part two of this sim, prepare the necessary adjusting, correcting journal entry and determine whether the current ratio is overstated, understated, or correctly stated as a result of failing to record the proper entry for each of the numbered items. So we're going to make a journal entry again if we need to, and we're going to determine whether the current ratio, not inventory turnover now, but the current ratio is overstated, understated, or correctly stated as a result of failing to record the proper entry. So in part one and one through four, we dealt with what was the effect on the inventory turnover ratio when we make the correcting entry. Well, in number five here, we want to know what's the effect on the current ratio if we fail to record the proper entry. So I want to get you ready because on the exam, they could ask it either way. So here's number five. During the final week of the year under audit, Major Corp recorded revenue for services actually rendered to clients in the subsequent year. So what's happening is it's the final week of the year under audit, Major Corp is recording revenue for services, but it says these services were actually rendered to clients when? Not in the year under audit, but in the subsequent year. Since this revenue was recorded in the year under audit, looks like they credited revenue, they debited accounts receivable, let's say. So that entry was made in error. Now we have to correct it by reversing it. We have to debit sales and credit accounts receivable. Now, what if we don't make that entry? What if we don't make the correction? What's the impact on the working capital ratio, the current ratio? Well, as a result of failing to record the entry above, the current ratio would have been overstated. Since accounts receivable, a current asset, would have been overstated. All right, what's the current ratio? It's current assets divided by current liabilities. So if current assets would have been overstated if you never made this correcting entry, then current assets were overstated, working capital would be overstated, the current ratio would be overstated. So we know the current ratio is current assets divided by current liabilities. And as current assets go, so goes the current ratio. So in number five, current assets were overstated if you don't make this entry, and as a result, the current ratio would be overstated. Let's go to number six. All right, six, Major Corp pays employees bi-weekly. That means every other week they get paid. Employee pay for regular and overtime work just before year end, but paid in the subsequent year, was not recorded by Major Corp 
in the year under audit. So the year ended December 31st and they did not record journal entries for unpaid wages at year end. What should the journal entry be at year end for unpaid wages? This is an example of an adjusting entry. It should be an accrual, an accrued liability. Wages expenses debited, wages payable is credited. Income statement this year, cash next year. That's an accrual. And if this entry is not recorded at year end, what's the impact on the current ratio? Current assets divided by current liabilities. Well, clearly the current liabilities would be understated if you don't make this entry. So if you don't make this entry, current liabilities would be understated. So working capital and the current ratio would be overstated. Since current liabilities would have been understated if you don't make this entry, the current ratio would have been overstated. So make a note, as current liabilities go, understated in this case, current ratio would go the opposite and be overstated. So in number six, we saw the relationship between current liabilities and the current ratio. As current liabilities go, they were understated. The current ratio goes the opposite of current liabilities. It was overstated. Back in number five, we were working with current assets like accounts receivable. We said if you don't make this entry, accounts receivable would be overstated. And we said as current assets go, which would have been overstated, so goes the current ratio, which would have been overstated. Let's go on to number seven. During the year under audit, a former employee of Major Corp sued the company for wrongful termination. Legal counsel has advised that it's reasonably possible that the company will be assessed damages in the estimated amount of $100,000. What do we do? What's the journal entry? How does it impact the current ratio by not making the entry at year end? So we can see that no entry was made for this at year end. Should there have been an entry made at year end? Well, since it's only reasonably possible and not probable that the company is going to suffer legal damages, only a footnote disclosure is required, not a journal entry. So there's no reason to debit a loss expense or credit a liability for contingency. Why? Because it's only reasonably possible, not probable that the company will be assessed damages. So footnote disclosure only, which means to answer number seven, you'd say no entry needed and no impact on the current ratio. So number seven is a good little review of what you need to know about loss accrual. So if you forgot what's going on with loss accrual, if it's just reasonably possible but doesn't rise to the level of probable, then footnote disclosure only in the financial statements. Journal entry would only be required if it was probable that the company would suffer a loss. Let's go to eight. The auditors confirmed Major Corp's line of credit with Shore Bank. So they must have sent a confirmation to Shore Bank. And the bank's confirmation reply indicated that interest due for the year under audit was unpaid at year end. So the bank's confirmation said something like, well, here's what your client owes us and the interest hasn't been paid yet as of year end. So it looks like there might be a liability outstanding. Monthly interest payments had been made for the first 11 months of the year. And the auditors noted that nothing was recorded for unpaid interest at year end, but it looks like something should have been recorded for unpaid interest since it's clear in the confirmation that interest is due for the year under audit. Now we can interpret this to mean that interest is due for the month of December because monthly interest payments had been made for the first 11 months of the year it says, but nothing was recorded for unpaid interest at year end, but it looks like something should have been recorded for December's unpaid interest to the bank due to that line of credit that they have. So the journal entry should be debit interest expense credit interest payable for the amount of December's interest and as a result interest payable is understated until you make this entry. Since current liabilities would have been understated if you don't make the entry, the current ratio would have been overstated. So as current liabilities go, in this case they would have been understated, the current ratio would have been overstated. So if you leave out current liabilities, working capital is going to be too high and the current ratio is going to be too high. 
What's the difference between working capital and the current ratio? Well, the current ratio we said is current assets divided by current liabilities. Working capital is current assets minus current liabilities. Number nine, Major Corp received cash in advance of 30000 in June, and by year end only 6000 remained unearned. No adjustment was made at year end, but the proper entry was made in June. Okay, what was the entry in June for the 30000 They said that entry was made. What was it? All right, well, the entry back in June was debit cash, 30000 credit unearned revenue, 30000 And what kind of an account is unearned revenue? It's a current liability. It's not revenue when you collect cash in advance. So it was recorded properly in June as a current liability. Then it told us that only 6000 remained unearned at the end of the year, and no adjustment was made for that. Since 6000 remains unearned at year end out of the 30000 then 24000 must have been earned between June and December. So the proper adjustment should be debit unearned revenue 24000 and credit earned revenue 24000 And they're saying if you don't make that entry, what will be the impact on the current ratio? Well, if you don't make that entry, then unearned revenue would be too high. The current liability would still be 30000 if you don't make that entry. So if current liabilities would be too high, then working capital would be too low and the current ratio would be too low. So failure to make the adjusting entry above for 24000 would result in current liabilities being overstated. Unearned revenue would be too high if you don't make this adjustment. And unearned revenue is a current liability. So current liabilities would be too high. And as current liabilities go, if they're overstated, working capital and the current ratio would be understated. Because as current liabilities go, working capital and the current ratio would go the opposite.